Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our online worship service. It's great to have you here and joining us. We trust that this will be a meaningful time for you as we worship the Lord together. Do want to just call your attention to some announcements real quickly. On June the 28th, there's going to be a missions team meeting here at the church after our worship service. If you're able to join us for that, we're going to talk about missions that we want to support and the yard sale, if we're going to do that or not. So be sure and join us for June 28th. Also on July the 12th, we have a Worship in the Park planning meeting. So as long as the Mint Festival continues and goes on, uh, we will be leading the worship service that Sunday at the park. Uh, but July the 12th is our planning meeting for that. Of course, the, the worship in the park isn't until August. So be sure and join us. That'll be after church on the 12th. Also, be sure to get this on your calendars. Sunday, July 26th at 4 o'clock, uh, Julie and I want to invite all of you to come and join us for a barbecue at our home. And it's just a time to get together and chat and enjoy each other's company. We hope that you'll be able to join us. Well, this is Father's Day weekend. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We've got a fun little Father's Day presentation we put together here. Uh, you know, who's that dad? It'll be a fun thing. And then a more meaningful uh, video after that, just to honor and thank all the, all the dads who are out there. We're going to have a time for the Lord's Supper, and then I'm going to be preaching, uh, continuing through my series through Acts chapter 2. So we're glad that you're here. Let's bow. I'd like to lead us in an opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together today to give you worship and praise. We thank you for our dads. We thank you for your presence and your blessing in our lives. And it is in Jesus' name we pray and thank you and ask these things. Be with us now. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's enjoy these Father's Day videos as uh, they're put together. Today is a special day, and it's bigger than we think. Because there are many different kinds of fathers, and they all need to be recognized and honored today. Today we honor those fathers who consistently strive to balance loving their wives and children with being good, godly workers at their jobs. May you feel the pleasure of God. Today, we honor those dads who had poor fathers themselves, but who have committed never to become the father they grew up under. May your children continue to be guarded from any of the hurt you carry. Today, we honor the fathers who are older and who no longer have day-to-day -day obligations to their own children. May the family gatherings this weekend make you feel like you could do it all over again. Today, we honor the adult children of fathers who are absent. May the God of the fatherless become your father in ways you've only dreamed of. 
And may you believe with your whole heart that his leaving wasn't your fault. Today, we honor men who have no children of their own, but who father younger men as mentors and guides. May you see your important roles as impacting and life-changing. And finally today, we honor fathers who have passed away. May their good deeds live on through you, and may their careless deeds be corrected in your lifetime. Today is a special day. So for all the fathers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be honored, be blessed, and be joyful. We believe that you have what it takes to change the world, and you're doing it one relationship at a time. Happy Father's Day.
As we share together in the Lord's Supper today, I want to read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul. He is speaking a message to Timothy, and here's what he says. I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. I picture this passage of scripture as we get our thoughts centered around the Lord's Supper because of Father's Day. You know, Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. He wasn't the biological father of Timothy. But just as that passage of scripture began, Paul is following in the footsteps of his forefathers, his spiritual forefathers, and now he is passing on his faith to Timothy. And he reminds Timothy to not be timid about what Jesus has done and to not be timid about testifying to the goodness of the Lord. And you know, when we share together in the Lord's Supper, we are testifying to the Lord's goodness. We are remembering his body that was broken when we eat the bread And we are remembering his blood that was shed for our salvation when we drink the juice. And so in that sense, we are testifying about the Lord. And remember that as you share together, as we share together in this Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ. And we realize that we are following in the footsteps of people who have gone before us fathers and mothers uh, in the spirit, in the spiritual sense, who loved you and who worshiped you and who served you faithfully and who have passed on that legacy of faith to us. May we be faithful to those coming up in the generations behind us. May we be bold and courageous in sharing the testimony of Jesus and the fact that he died on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of sins and be called your children. Bless us now, this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Our story is Adam and Eve's story. We were hiding in the garden, making excuses for our sin, unable to cover up our shame. Our story is Jonah's story. We were running from God, denying our calling, surrounded by a raging sea. Our story is a prodigal son story. We were wasting our blessings, lost in our failures, too afraid to return home. Our story is Peter's story. We were unbelieving, full of fear and doubt, our faith slowly sinking beneath the waves. But that is not the end of our story. We are all longing to be restored. We want to stop running. We want to be found. We want to believe, and we are crying out for a Savior. So God stepped in, into a broken world, into human form, into our very lives. God stepped into our mess, into our sin, into our failure, our fear, our doubt. He stepped into death. And the door shut behind him.
and then he arose and left it all in the grave. He wiped clean our story and started writing a new one. One without shame, without fear, without death. A story full of love and forgiveness. A story of redemption and restoration. It's our life story. It's His story. It's a resurrection story. Funerals usually go calmly, but sometimes things happen that change everything. Perhaps the greatest example of that is what took place on the first Easter morning as the women arrived to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. But then they find that the stone was rolled away and the body of Jesus was missing. There was a lot of confusion that morning, a lot of running around, a lot of consternation and emotional upheaval on that first Easter morning. It was supposed to be a simple funeral, but now people wondered what was going on. You know, where was Jesus' body? What do we do now? People were not calm, anything but at peace. On February 26th of this year, something similar happened at St. Anthony's Church, a small congregation near Pasadena, California. A body went missing, and it caused a stir. As the funeral home was preparing for the funeral at a church, at the church, the driver of the hearse pulled up to the church door next to the place uh, where he would be taking in flowers. And he, he took a, a big vase of flowers in through the church building, and he left his keys in the hearse because he planned to just take the flowers quickly in and then he thought he'd be back out. But he ended up staying in the building a little longer than he anticipated because he assisted a fellow attendant with some other funeral details. Well, after getting that done, he went back outside and discovered that the hearse was missing. It was nowhere to be found, including the casket and the body that was inside. The police put out an all-points bulletin concerned about a body on the loose, and they asked the person who stole the hearse to at least return the body so that the family could hold the funeral service and bury their loved one. Well, the hearse wasn't spotted until the next morning, and then a high-speed chase ensued down the highway that it was seen on. It ended when the driver totally... Uh, totaled out the hearse in an accident with the casket and the body still inside. Well, think about this. For a day, the body was missing. Can you imagine the consternation and the upheaval of those who had gathered to mourn the loss of a loved one on that day of the funeral when it was supposed to have taken place? Can you imagine how bad they must have felt, even more than they were already feeling when they were first told that their loved one wasn't where she was supposed to be? Now, had that been Jesus, they wouldn't have simply found his casket. They would have probably found him driving the vehicle, right? <laughs> On that first Easter morning, Mary and his disciples were upset when they discovered that the body of Jesus was missing. It was nowhere to be found but when he was later found, or more accurately, when he later found Mary and the other apostles, his body wasn't in a tomb or in a casket. Jesus had risen from the dead, and everything changed for the disciples in our world after that. This morning, we continue in our message series, When the Church is Present, which is taking us through the second chapter of the New Testament book of Acts. Today we are looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 24 through 36, which shows us that the church was founded on Jesus' resurrection. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 24 through 36. Open up your Bible or your smartphone, Acts chapter 2, verses 24 through 36. One thing to note as we look more closely about Jesus' resurrection and what was going on on that day, one thing to note is the fact that Jesus 
was really dead. Jesus really died. Often I'll hear someone say that Jesus didn't really die when he was crucified, but that he was just badly wounded. In fact, someone once said to me that what they thought happened is after Jesus was crucified, he was so unconscious, he was breathing so shallowly that people thought he was dead, but he really wasn't. And so they placed Jesus in the cool tomb, right, the coolness of the tomb, and after three days, he revived in the coolness of his grave, and he got up, he pushed away the heavy stone covering his tomb, and he walked out. If I'm remembering correctly, there's even a popular book and movie, The Da Vinci Code, that came out a few years ago proposing the theory that maybe Jesus didn't really die, but that he lived on and he even got married and had kids after that. Well, that's not what the biblical record and eyewitness testimony states, however. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 24 through 31. Here we see that a thousand years before Jesus lived and died, David, king of Israel, prophesied about the death and resurrection of Jesus in Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. As Peter points this out in his message to the people, he speaks with the authority of one who knows that what David had prophesied came true. Jesus really did die but he didn't stay dead. And here's what Peter says. Acts chapter 2, verses 24 through 31. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter goes on, quoting from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. After he says that, he says, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. See, Jesus really died. We need to establish that historical fact. He was crucified by Roman soldiers who were under order to execute him. The Romans were experts at putting people to death. They knew what they were doing, and they didn't just let people slip through the cracks. Jesus was scourged to within an inch of his life. Then he was crucified with spikes being driven through his wrists and through his feet. He hung in the hot sun for hours like that. He suffocated. His heart exploded. Then the soldiers drove a spear through his lungs, resulting in the flow of blood and water, indicating that Jesus had died. Nobody survives that. The disciples' response after Jesus was crucified indicates that they were deeply sad. They were grieved over his death. They literally ran for their lives, like how rabbits will scatter in my backyard and scurry off when I chase them away. They went into hiding, and then they went back to their regular jobs in the days that followed. They had no intention of establishing a church because their leader had died. I just want to note one other thing about Jesus' death before moving on from that. Jesus intentionally sacrificed himself for you and me. That's important to recognize because some people believe that Jesus was merely set up and entrapped by the schemes of those who were in power. You know, he was like the little guy and he was bucking against the Jewish system. And so they crucified him to get him out of the way and and to keep their power for themselves because he was getting too popular with the people. But another reason why Peter brings up David's prophecy about the Messiah in Psalm 16 is to emphasize that this was, in fact, God's plan for saving us all along. 
It's told that in the First World War there was a young French soldier who was seriously wounded. His arm was so badly crushed that it had to be amputated. He was a strong and enthusiastic and energetic young man and the surgeon felt bad that he had to cut off his maimed arm. And so he waited beside the young man's bedside to tell him the bad news just as soon as he recovered from his unconsciousness. When the man's eyes opened, the surgeon said to him, I'm, I'm really sorry to have to tell you that you have lost your arm. But the young soldier said, Sir, I did not lose it. I gave it for France. I gave it for France. When Jesus died, <clears throat> he was not helplessly caught up in a mesh of circumstances from which he couldn't break free. In fact, the Bible is quite clear. To the very end, he could have turned back and saved his life if had he desired. He did not lose his life. He gave it. He willingly died for us. Well, Peter's message not only recognizes Jesus' death, but it also recognizes that Jesus did not stay dead, but he resurrected to life. You see, Jesus' resurrection from the dead is what gives Jesus the power to deliver us from our sin and from our death. In verse 24, Peter proclaims another point. Even death itself could not hold the sinless Son of God. You see, he says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Yes, Jesus died, but then he raised to life. There's a story told about three buddies who were discussing death, and one of them asked the other two in the group, he said, what would you like people to say about you at your funeral? It's a good question, isn't it? What would you like people to say about you at your funeral? Well, one of them said he wanted people to say he was a great humanitarian who cared about his community and his family. The second guy said, I want people to say that he was a great husband and father who was an example for many to follow. The third guy, the last friend, he just kind of shook his head and he said, well, you guys are way too deep for me. All I want people to say at my funeral is, look, he's moving. <laughs> Wouldn't we all like to hear those words? You know what? Jesus' resurrection is another indication that he is the Messiah. Romans 3.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. But then in John chapter 20, verse 9, it says it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Why? Since Jesus never sinned, death could not hold him down. He died in place of you and me. He died for us personally, but death could not hold him permanently. That's how he could rise again. In quoting Psalm 16, Peter states that David, who was a prophet, was speaking about the Messiah, who would not remain in the tomb, but would be resurrected. David not only understood the Messiah's necessary death, but he foretold his resurrection. Since David had died and was buried, and he was still dead to that day, Peter concludes that David cannot have been speaking of himself in that psalm, but that he must have envisioned some later figure who would come and escape death. Well, in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Peter says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Peter and his colleagues who were there gathered on that day of Pentecost gave their personal eyewitness testimony. God raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Peter reminds all those present that Many gathered there that day were personal witnesses to the death and resurrection of Jesus. If somebody wanted to question it, all they'd have to do was ask them. The message of the death and resurrection of Christ takes precedence over all other factors in the witnessing of the early Christians. Nothing was more important. The resurrection of Jesus is the power behind our salvation. The church has always understood that. The Apostle Paul would later quote a creed of the church that was written five to ten years 
after Peter's message was preached on the day of Pentecost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8, Paul quotes that early Christian belief when he says these words, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of who are still living, though some have fallen asleep, he says. Paul goes on, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one untimely born. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is proof that he is who he said he is and that he can do what he said he came to do. He is the Son of God who came into our world to become the perfect sacrifice in our place for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God and live with him forever in peace and satisfaction. By his resurrection to life, Jesus is vindicated by the authority he receives and by the Holy Spirit he pours out. That's just one additional reason why the church is founded on the resurrection of Jesus. He is the only one who can make the eternal difference in us with God. On the day of Pentecost, as Peter preaches the first Christian message ever preached, before he extends the invitation to receive Jesus, he ends by pointing out the fact that the resurrection grants Jesus the exalted position at the Father's right hand of being Lord and Messiah. You see, People in their sin may have abused and crucified Jesus, but his resurrection from death vindicates who he is and that he is able to bring us true forgiveness from our rebellion against God. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 33 through 36. Here's what it says. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter and the believers were not a drunken crowd as they had earlier been accused of being, but they were a crowd of Holy Spirit-filled witnesses to the fact that God had raised Jesus to life. Jesus was the Messiah who became King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as predicted by David in Psalm 110, verse 1, which Peter quotes here. Because Jesus is ascended and exalted, he has sent the promised spirit to empower and enable the church to present the gospel message and to be those witnesses to the world. The humble carpenter from Nazareth was not only the Messiah, but now he is the exalted God of heaven. It is he who has sent his spirit, just as he promised he would do earlier in Acts. The promise of sending his spirit is now fulfilled In claiming that Jesus does the work of sending God's Spirit, Peter indicates Jesus' unity with God the Father in purpose and in power. Jesus' exaltation doesn't end with his resurrection from the dead. He was raised to God's right hand because he is God in the flesh. In his ascension, the resurrected Jesus is glorified by God the Father to a position of authority over all things. Jesus is now seen for who he really is. That's why all this stuff is happening. And so Jesus, he sits at the Father's right hand of authority. The Holy Spirit cooperates with him in perfect unity. He is the Lord and Messiah who takes away the sins of the world. Amen? The Jewish mob who killed Jesus had grossly misunderstood him. God, though, still used their actions to authenticate him as both Israel's Lord and as the fulfillment of the promises about the Messiah. In closing, I want to share with you a story about how the waters off of the coast of South Africa got their name changed. 
The southernmost point of Africa is a point that always has experienced tremendous storms. For many years, no one knew what lay beyond that cape, for no ship attempting to round that point had ever returned to tell the tale. Among the ancients, it was known as the Cape of Storms. That was the name of it, the Cape of Storms. But then a Portuguese explorer in the 16th century, Vasco da Gama, successfully sailed around that very point, right, and found beyond the wild raging storms a great calm sea, and beyond that, the shores of India. The name of the Cape was changed from the Cape of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. That is its name even today. Until Jesus Christ rose from the dead, death had been the cape of storms on which all the hopes of life beyond this world had been wrecked. No one knew what lay beyond this point until the first Easter morning. Suddenly, like those ancient explorers, we can see beyond human death to the hope of heaven and eternal life with the Father. We know that we shall experience in our own human lives exactly what the Son of God experienced in his own life. For the risen Christ says to us, Because I live, you shall live also. Say that with me. Because I live, you shall live also. This is the heart of our faith. The gospel message, though, is not only good news about what Jesus did, the fact that he you know, died for our sins and rose again. The gospel message is also what he offers us as a result. Jesus offers the salvation of all who believe in him as Lord and Messiah. And so, based on these facts, those who heard the gospel preached for the very first time, they asked, what should we do? What should we do? It's a good question, isn't it? What we should do is just what Peter commands us to do in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, my friends. It doesn't matter how messy your past is. Your future can be spotless. It makes no difference how badly you have screwed up in the past. Your next choice is the opportunity for a fresh new start. If you need to take those next steps, then I want to encourage you to contact us here at the church. Give me a call, send me an email, and we'll talk about the next steps that you need to take to get your life right with Jesus. Repent and be baptized. That's what Peter said in answer to their question, what shall we do? They had the faith, and now they needed to receive Jesus Christ for their own good. Will you do the same? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to be able to dig into your word and to see how your church was born and, and to understand how it is founded on the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for our Lord and Savior's example because it gives us confidence that no matter what we go through, we know that when we go through that doorway of death, we will rise again even as our Lord has risen from the dead. Not to, just to live unto ourselves, but to live directly in your presence and to fellowship with you and to know that we are loved. I pray for your favor and blessing upon everyone who is worshiping online today. Be with them. Give them your peace and comfort and strength. Keep us healthy. This we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Happy Father's Day to you dads who are out there. Make it a great week. Yeah.